Thanks so much, uh, Joshua. Appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jamil Jaffer, as Joshua said. Um, it's my uh, honor to introduce this terrific panel to talk about intellectual property, innovation, um, and China. Uh, so we'll start uh, my immediate uh, right uh, all the way over. Uh, Megan Beery is the Director of Government and Strategic Security Affairs at Global Foundries, a US headquartered semiconductor foundry. There are only a few of those, so we're very excited to have uh, Megan with us. In her role there, she manages a range of strategic security, export control, and regulatory matters, and drives the development of US federal policy to protect technology advantage in the semiconductor industry. Prior to that, Megan worked at the Semiconductor Industry Association as Director for Global Technology and Security Policy. She's held a number of other jobs, including in the government um, as Director of Strategic Trade and Nonproliferation at the National Security Council in the White House. She's a former, I guess you're never a former US Marine Corps officer, serving intelligence and protocol to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. She's a BA, she has BA degrees in poli sci and music from the University of Rochester, an MA in International Security Studies from Georgetown, um, and is a native of Michigan, my, the, the, state, the home state of my former boss, uh, Congressman Mike Rogers. Uh, immediately to Megan's right is Professor Dan Perdome. Professor Perdome is an assistant professor at Florida International University's College of Business in Miami, Florida. He's a research associate at Duke University's China campus. Prior to joining academia, Professor Perdome worked for a decade in consulting in other roles in Beijing and Shanghai, uh, focusing on intellectual property, innovation, and international trade management. Prior to that, he was in the public sector. He's formally advised the World Bank, the European Intellectual Property Office, um, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences, along with a number of other organizations. He, has a, he holds a PhD in management and was a visiting fellow at the University of Oxford. He holds graduate degrees in law and public policy as well. And certainly last but certainly not least is Dr. John Putnam. Uh, Dr. Putnam founded Competition Dynamics as a platform for economic research and testimony at the intersection of IP, competition, international trade law, he holds BA, MA, and PhD degrees in economics from Yale, where he specialized in international macro and R&D economics. He also received fellowships at Yale and Columbia Law Schools. Um, and from 2001 to 2005, held a professorship in law and economics of IP at the Center for Innovation Law and Policy at the University of Toronto, my hometown. We don't often admit that, but it's true. Um, and Dr. Putnam regularly testifies in, in a variety of large-scale IP litigation, uh, including cases with a billion dollars in controversy, including Medtronic, Apple v. Qualcomm, you name it, he's involved in it. So uh, with that, uh, let's just jump right into the conversation. I'd love to start at the top uh, with Professor Perdome. So uh, Dan, talk to us about uh, the concept of intellectual property protection. Talk to us about how that ties into this larger competition we have with China. We know uh, that, that China is viewed today uh, as the near peer, if not a peer competitor with the United States across a variety of dynamics, whether that's economic competition, political competition, or the like. What does intellectual property have anything to do uh, with uh, our competition with China, and why are we even talking about China in this context? Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, well, th there's a lot <laughs> a lot that I could say there. Um, I could deconstruct the question, I guess, in, in a few ways. One is, and I, and I know you didn't mention the word win, but I think we often sort of associate this concept of sort of how can we uh, win in this competition with China, whether it's in IP or innovation and so on. And I think uh, thinking about uh, these issues in that context can be a little bit difficult for a few reasons. One is sort of uh, we have to think about what do we mean by winning this competition, right? What kind of indicators do we use? Are we talking about being first to market with innovations in terms of uh, having a very large sort of uh, set of adopters of, of new innovations? Uh, are we talking about profitability, market share, and so on? The other question is sort of uh, when uh, are we talking about winning in this sort of race, if you will? And with the exception of some declining industries, let's say textiles, for example, Typically, competition, and this is definitely going to be this, the, the, the case for competition between the US and China based upon innovation and otherwise, sort of ebbs and flows, right? There's leaders, there's sort of followers, and so you can't sort of look at that at a static point in time and say, you know, we are going to win and <laughs> there's going to be the sustained competitive advantage. So uh, I think that's another thing to consider. Another, another thing to consider is sort of when is this winning in this competition, or rather, where is this winning in this competition going to take place? And I, I think uh, you know, if things continue as they are, there perhaps is this balkanization of, of markets for innovation. So we have sort of Chinese companies being crowded out in some sectors, at least, of the US market. Um, but meanwhile, certainly Chinese companies will be very competitive in China, perhaps in other emerging markets. Uh, 
Um, and one last thing I would say is that we have to be careful in, ter in terms of sort of the tone that we, that we assign to this kind of debate because when we talk about winning and losing, of course, healthy competition is, is very important for innovation. Um, everybody, I think, in this room would agree that. But I sense that recently, certainly in political circles, there's a lot of negative con con connotation with that, sort of us versus them. China is evil. Um, and I think that can be very dangerous for, at a minimum for the, the significant numbers of, of Chinese uh, uh, ethnicity individuals living in the US for expats working in China. And another sort of thing to consider is what's the purpose of all this, right? Is it to self-assure ourselves that we're leading in certain technological sectors? That obviously can lead to complacency. So uh, it can be dangerous in that sense. Yeah. Well, you know, Megan, one of the places we've seen a lot of this discussion and debate about China, about the uh, potential economic and, and technological threat comes in the semi semiconductor industry, right? We just saw the CHIPS Act, uh, which uh, will provide billions of dollars uh, to U.S. companies uh, to build or and, and other companies to build uh, capability here in the United States. Um, your company has, has been out there out front of this doing that. Talk to us about how you think about uh, the technological and competitive threat uh, that China poses uh, in the semiconductor industry and perhaps to innovation more generally. And talk to us a little bit, if you could, about sort of this question of Taiwan, right? There's, there's obviously huge semiconductor capabilities there. Uh, it's part of China under the one China policy, but of course, we have a separate relationship with Taiwan. We saw Nancy Pelosi go visit there. We sell them all sorts of military equipment. That's a huge issue in play. So uh, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to throw eight questions at you in one shot, but, but talk to us generally about, about semiconductors, IP, and, and, and the China competition. Sure, uh, thank you. So that's, yeah, a book, uh, sort of unto itself, um, but happy to dive into some of that. Um, so an enormously complex and, and critical issue right now, um, and, and thrilled to be a part of it, but it's, but it's a, a very significant conversation that we need to have as a, as a government, um, po as policymakers, as industry. Um, so it's sort of illustrative. Uh, I just happened to be at a gathering of CISOs yesterday, and, uh, which was a, a tremendously interesting conversation, but I can, I can tell you that the security professionals are, uh, are alarmed. Um, you know, the, the threats are certainly increasing. Uh, as one illustrative anecdote, a uh, company was, was speaking to me and said, they're sort of a smaller company, not as well known perhaps, but their name had been dropped by President Biden um, several weeks ago. And this is fantastic. The, the attention that the industry is drawing and that these companies are drawing is fantastic. We're in the spotlight and that's great. But they said also immediately almost they had a swell in cyber incidents. Mm. Um, and for days thereafter. So, uh, and this was just connect, you know, where we are in the spotlight, um, their, their name was mentioned, hadn't received a lot of attention, and so everyone starts pulling up this company, and, and here we go, you know, they become a target for, for cyber attack. Um, so that's kind of uh, what we're seeing in the industry as a whole now. We are front page news, we're, we're the critical industry, we are, we are uh, the, the center of the bullseye, the center of the target. And so this is fantastic in one sense in that we're getting sort of a, a resurgence, a rebirth in interest uh, from a national level, national level, federal, state, all the way down into rebuilding this sector, which we absolutely have to do for, for national and economic security purposes. Um, but then at, um, by the same token, then we also become a target of, um, you know, others who, who uh, for whom also this industry is a critical national security industry, and, and so um, we become a target. This becomes um, a, big, a big security concern. So as we put these investments into the industry, as the government puts these investments into the industry, um, then we need to take increased action to make sure those investments are secure. Yeah. Uh, so, so that gets into a lot of different, uh, there are a lot of different ways to do that, a lot of different dynamics, policy dynamics, cybersecurity um, dynamics, um, and happy to dive into to several of those. Um, but then the, the Taiwan piece of it is, uh, adds a whole other dimension. Of course, um, you know, it's, we have this confluence of events right now uh, geopolitically between the, um, and technologically, between the pandemic and uh, what had already been a changing techn technological ecosystem anyway prior to the pandemic with the increased digital infrastructure and electric vehicles, um, and, and then the pandemic, um, the Russia-Ukraine situation, which uh, then potentially becomes a cue for China-Taiwan. Um, and 
this has resulted in kind of, again, a, an increased spotlight of the national security sector on this critical industry prior to, prior, you know, 2015 or so prior to a lot of the starting. No one knew, I mean, chips, like potato chips, you know. <laughs> Someone, someone relate to to our uh, someone in my company. Where do you get your potatoes? Um, not understanding what the chip industry is. Um, obviously, an incredibly different dynamic right now. Um, so the 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 geopolitical situation we're looking at with Taiwan um, only lends more urgency to the national security imperative here in the United States to build our domestic ecosystem. That's that's tremendous. It's positive, but it's also quite alarming. The industry, I would say, is becoming more attuned to potential supply chain issues between COVID-0 and China, um, and of course, the, the recent um, escalation of um, tensions between, in between China and Taiwan. Um, even those CEOs and, and those companies in the industry who had previously perhaps not wanted to, to be embroiled, involved in, in US-China tensions are now increasingly uh, cognizant of, appreciative of uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, we have some very serious dynamics here in China and in the region and, um, and increasingly looking to diversify supply chains yeah. um, and to pull out of that. So. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, yeah. and I know a lot to unpack, but um, but a really interesting time. Yeah, and I do want to dive into some of that with you. But let me ask let me ask you, John. So um, you know, one of the things that we um, we heard uh, from Dan uh, was this idea that that you know we're in this competition. We know we knew that, right? But there has been a lot of talk about winning and losing, and what that looks like, and whether that's the right the right the right framing. You know, where that winning might happen, when that winning might happen. You know, is it dynamic? Talk to us about how you see the competition, John. Um, how you see it playing out. And you know, there's been a lot of talk, and I know you've done some research in this space, there's been a lot of talk about is China winning and how do we know and why the, the quantity of patents has been a topic of some discussion. Talk to us about, about that piece of it. Um, and then I do want to come back to you, Megan, and talk about some of these some of the issues you raised. But, but John, talk to us about sort of what this competition looks like from the outside and how can we measure it? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I want to follow up on Dan's uh, point about winning and what do you mean by winning? Um, uh, I think that there's sort of two narratives that one can engage in about China, and both are legitimate, but it's important to keep them separate. One of them is China as a bad actor, and the other is China as a competitor and potentially a misguided competitor. And so what do I mean by that in this competition? Um, if you look at it purely as an economist, you would say that China is not a peer of the United States. Why do I say that? Well, China's economy is give or take half the size of the United States economy. How does that break down? Um, China has more than four times as many people as the United States does, but it has, its per capita income is about one eighth or one ninth of the United States. So if you're, have got four times as many people and you've got one eighth the per capita income, then you're about half the size of the US. They're growing a lot faster than the US, but they are still a developing country. That's fine, so far so good. The way you want the world to work in that situation is you want high wage countries like the US to design, uh, to invent and design things. And then you want them manufactured in the low wage country where, the where it's cheaper to manufacture things. That's efficient. That increases um, global welfare because the high wage country trades with the low wage, wage country. The high wage country specializes in innovation. The low wage country specializes in manufacturing. China doesn't like that game, okay? They want to also be the country that is innovating, and they want to look like a country that is innovating, and they do that in several fashions. One of them is by um, taking our technology. And this, sort of, this is part of the China as a bad actor uh, um, narrative. I worked, uh, I've worked at several cases at the International Trade Commission where a Chinese firm has simply taken over a Western firm, and um, then started to export the technology or the products that were misappropriated. Uh, this is these are theft of trade secret cases um, to the U.S. and the U.S. has blocked the imports of those products. But of course, that only protects the U.S. market, which is an increasingly small fraction of the world market. You don't get global relief for trade secret misappropriation in China 
even if it's uh, of a U.S. company, all you can do is protect the domestic market. So that's a concerted action. And then the, the second um, breakdown, I guess I would say, in the competition is that um, China is willing to engage in uh, competition that uh, puts its own people at a disadvantage. So we think of the gains from trade as being things that benefit all of us. The great thing about the patent system, for example, is it's a decentralized system that allows, doesn't force the government to pick winners and losers. It allows individuals to innovate, trade pieces of intellectual property. China's got a much more centralized view of that. And they're willing to tolerate um, economic inequality for the sake of being able to uh, advance their economy faster. So rather than trying to find good paying manufacturing jobs in China, that's only part of their strategy. Part of their strategy is to become a peer of the US by um, stealing and, and also legitimately investing in R&D to become a, an uh, innovation peer. We would say that's inefficient. They would say, don't tell us what to do. We think it's in our best interest to, for our country to develop this way. So we kind of have a, by trying to think of this as a competition, what we're, what we're saying is, you guys should specialize in manufacturing and we'll pay you for it. And they're saying, no, 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 you're treating us like poor people. We want to be as rich as you, we think we're as powerful as you, we're gonna have as big a navy as you, and this sort of thing. And so in some ways, we're, this competition is something where we're um, playing different games. So you see this, for example, in the, um, uh, Jamil mentioned a paper that I wrote recently about Chinese patenting. Um, when you're confronted by a bear, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to get up on your hind legs and make yourself look big, right? Some bears. Some you don't want to do that with grizzlies. <laughs> you don't do that with black bears. Grizzlies, that'll get you killed. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm an economist. I know nothing about bears. Okay? That's what I hear. I also hear that you don't have to actually run faster than, than the bear. You just got to run faster than the other guy behind yes. you, right? So You learned this in Toronto when you were growing up, right? Exactly. Yeah, three what... years in Canada, <laughs> that's what I learned. Um, uh, China, China has uh, subsidized patent applications. So China is now by far the world's leading producer of patents. In the United States, in a given year, um, there's maybe you know, 300,000 patents granted, um, uh, or filed, I should say filed. In China, the number is more like 1.5 million. And so the narrative of China as a misguided competitor is that, well, you know, uh, look how, if, if we're looking at the competition as who's doing more innovation and all we can do is count patents, then China looks like it's a big competitor with us. But if you actually look at the level of R&D spending in China and um, the, other the other inputs into actually innovating things, China is much smaller. Now, again, China is growing faster. I am not trying to minimize the economic or competitive threat at all, but the true number of patents in China is something more like 200,000 of, of true applications, not 1.5 million. And so the question is, and, and but the government is, in, is subsidizing the production of these patents. And so you might say, well, shouldn't we appeal to their, to their self-interest and say, why are you wasting your money on producing paper patents that don't have any good? they obviously perceive this as being in their interest for some reason. They're making themselves look big. We're saying you're being inefficient. They say we don't care. So I bring this up to say that the competition between the US and China is um, in some ways a competition for whose ideology is going to uh, govern world trade in the rest of this century. Is it gonna be the decentralized specialization framework that we've had ever since David Ricardo or is it gonna be the centralized view of competition where a country is willing to actually choose a lower, in the short run, a lower welfare outcome for the sake of what it believes will be a dominant strategy in the future? And frankly, it's the, I think the jury is still out on whether the centralized approach to the war or the decentralized approach to the war is gonna be the more successful. As Americans, we would typically say the decentralized approach to a war is better. There's all the movies about soldiers and how they jury rigged some, you know, bomb to blow up the German, you know, encampment or something like that through American innovation. It's a great narrative. But there's a place for a central, uh, central planning in a war 
too. And whether in the innovation competition with China, we need more centralization or less centralization or some co different combination of decentralization and centralization is a very complex policy problem that the United States as a more decentralized culture is still trying to figure out. Yeah, thanks, John. And you know, it's it's funny. I actually want to talk to Dan about the about the centralization decentralization dynamic. Uh, but actually, I'm going to ask you a question first, Megan. First of all, you're the only war fighter on the panel, so we can actually talk about which is which is a better way to fight a war. But before I get to that, I'm interested in your thoughts on on the point that John made at the at the outset of his, sort of his answer to my question, uh, which was this issue about you know the U.S. thinking about China as uh, ourselves as the innovator. China's the manufacturer, their desire to be the innovator as well, their theft of intellectual property and the like. You know, one of the ways we saw this play out was in the early days of semiconductors, right? Or maybe the, maybe the mid days of semiconductors when Intel, when Intel decided, look, we're gonna stop manufacturing semiconductors here, we're gonna do the innovation, we're gonna do the IP, we're gonna do the high end stuff. We'll send all that, you know, cyclical stuff, we'll put it overseas, we'll put it in Taiwan, we'll put it, you know, other places. We'll get the low cost of production over there. We'll teach them how to do it. And they'll make our commodity stuff. And we'll still make some of the good stuff here. Then over time, we saw it. We happened with TSMC, perhaps most famously. We'll teach us how to innovate. We can do it. We can still give you that cost reduction here. Now they're doing three nanometer, right? We're Intel and other, other, other folks are behind. I know Global Foundry has a good story there, but, but just give us a sense of whether that's a case in point of, of putting aside the theft piece, right? Is that a case in point of what happens? And if that's the case, how do we get out of that dynamic when we're thinking about, there's a lot of talk about onshoring and reshoring, but let's be real, we're not gonna do commodity manufacturing here, right? We just probably can't afford that, can we? Thanks, so, so the semiconductor industry is probably the most capital intensive industry out there. And so that's why we've seen this um, uh, concentration of manufacturing um, and concentration in um, Asian countries where industrial policy is the norm, subsidization is high, um, and so f manufacturing, fabrication facilities, all of the capital intensive manufacturing uh, really has moved to that, to that region. Singapore, um, Malaysia, China, Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, massive, massive industrial policy and subsidization. Now, uh, now we're sort of finding is that U.S. moves into industrial policy. Uh, we're not very good at it. Um, it's, and almost a it's a bad word in many circles, at least the ones that I run It is a bad word. At. It is a bad word. And I've been in the government, and we didn't talk about it. We weren't ready for it. It, it certainly took a while for us to make that shift. Right. Um, and we made that shift for, for a lot of reasons that I sort of talked through previously. Um, but, but it's going to take a while to really learn how to do that, we're certainly not going to be on the scale. We just won't be, the U.S., um, the same scale as the Singapore, as certainly China, um, as, as some of these other countries. But sense from the industry is um, we want to be in the U.S. for a lot of reasons. We want to be in the U.S. Um, there are benefits, not, not necessarily financial, short term, um, in terms of subsidies, incentives, but we want to be in the United States um, at a minimum to, to, to diversify and have redundancy of supply here in the United States. And so the sense is at least chip in a little, pardon the pun, um, but at, <laughs> at least you know, show us a little, a little skin, yeah. uh, United States, and make this economical. These are real business decisions that, that companies have to make. Um, now, now China is, is on a scale above and beyond anyone else in the industry, certainly. Um, and but it sort of goes to show that the amount of money that you're putting into it is um, is not the end all be all. Mm. Absolutely. In fact, China is realizing this right now. We've seen uh, recently uh, there's been reporting about China's anti-corruption campaign, right. and they're cleaning house in the National IC Fund. Um, and a lot of the big semiconductor firms, because President Xi is uh, very displeased, and as he should be, with the with the state of progress that the um, that China's semiconductor industry has made. So, so it kind of goes back to how do you how do you develop an innovative ecosystem? Well, throwing money at it is is not going to get you there. Not in an ecosystem as complex and a technology as complex um, as semiconductors, where you really need to have that uh, that innovative capacity uh, and, and workforce um, and, and simply having a top-down um, 
centralized, innovative, uh, state-mandated uh, ecosystem is not going to answer it. Now, just say one last thing, is that uh, we're very interested to watch who uh, is being backfilled into these positions in the National IC Fund and in these companies, which uh, should raise alarm bells here um, in, um, in policy circles um, and in security circles, which are, are their defense, um, defense personnel. So yeah. um, certainly, you know, what we're seeing in China is we, uh, not that we would expect them to, but will not back down off of these strategic goals. Right. So come hell or high water, we're going to throw any state resources, both money, but also personnel, so military personnel, PLA personnel, coming in to say, we'll get this job done. Um, now, you know, we know, of course, what that means, uh, you know, other, other resources that they'll bring to bear to the problem um, that, that will just increase some of the security concerns that we have yeah. um, here in the, United, um, in, in the United States and in partner countries. Um, but you know they they just won't they won't back down off of the off of the problem. I don't know if that answered your question. No, it does. It, it does. So so Dan, how about that? So 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 you know John talks about this decentralization centralization dynamic. I mean, we do need. There are some benefits to centralization. Megan even said you know we got to think about industrial policy, right? These are things that you know that that sort of put me on edge, right? I, and I'm a believer. By the way. The U.S. has long believed in industrial policy, right? We have industrial policy for our defense industry. We've long had one for telecommunications. Technology, though, we've done the exact opposite, right? And the technology industry has boomed and grown in large part, I argue, because of we haven't gotten the government's fingers in it, right? Now, maybe there's a need here, and I, I'm a big supporter of the CHIPS Act. I think it's the right thing to do. But how do we? How should we think about it? And the government's not good at picking winners and losers. I mean, it's, it's affordably terrible at that, right? How should we think about industrial policy, centralization, decentralization, and what does that have to do with intellectual property? I mean, in some ways, government grand monopolies are at the heart of right, our IP theory, but they're government grand monopolies for a time period to private actors to invest in, not sort of government subsidized, you know, mass amounts of money, and then we want something for it, build it here. Yeah. So. I guess I can, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll partially comment on, on some things that John said about the indicators of IP indicators, yeah, please. which yeah, gets yeah. into the last uh, sort of part of your question, which I think John was certainly on track with that. In terms of the big, big picture question about, you know, is there a place for industrial policy in the U.S. in the area of technology and so on? Uh, I, I think absolutely, and I think it's actually probably a myth that uh, the U.S. has not been investing in basic research. I mean, right. we look sure. at an incredible amount of technologies that probably you, you take for granted. Touchscreen technologies, right? GPS, the internet, the uh, even the mRNA, sort of the, the the core technology there, right? The list goes on. Lithium iron batteries, literally an incredible amount of technologies that were funded either fully or in part by the U.S. government. You know, DARPA at the basic science level. At the basic science level, right? And, and it's, but it's not just uh, always just funding things, but also there was some sort of choosing of technology, suggestions of directions to take technology. Even in semiconductors, right, there was a market when it first came out from uh, uh, Texas Instruments and so on, from, from NASA and US Air Force. The government procurement actually made a market for these types of technologies. So again, it's, it's a myth that the private sector, at least at a basic level, is always responsible for innovation in all kinds of technology in the US. And I think a lot of people in the policy spheres in the US are realizing this. We need to continue and perhaps ramp up investment uh, in, in basic research. There really is a need to focus, however, on making sure that doesn't just sit idle, right? And make sure that there's actual commercial applications for that. From which actually, basic research, you mean? Well, no, to, to turn basic research ah. into applied research, right? To make it actually something that has a practical application. And China, China is actually quite good in that regard in terms of applied research for the most part. So again, my general take would be, you know, there does need, there is a place for government. Of course, you know, picking winners and things like this can be very dangerous. One thing I would say, though, if you compare the US versus Chinese systems is I've always found that, that the Chinese system has a higher appetite for risk taking and failure in many senses. And if you know anything about innovation, failure is very important. Right? In the US, we are obsessed with short run assessments, cost versus benefits. Right? If the investments in Solyndra didn't, you know, whatever company it is, uh, within a certain amount of period of time didn't result in certain kinds of innovations, people are all over it. The government should be investing in this sector. I believe that there is, you know, you, you, that is one way to look at it, but China, I think there are some advantages that they have for sort of a general acceptance of failure, perhaps failure in terms of taxpayers' money. And, you know, you can argue about if that's a good or bad thing, but I do think in, in some senses it can be an advantage 
uh, for them. I could also comment on the IP indicators if you want, or we can. Well, let's, come let's back we'll to come it. back to that. But let me yeah. let me just follow up on that on that point about failure. Um, so so when you talk about the China's more tolerant of failure yeah. relative to the U.S., I assume you mean their government is more tolerant of failure That's right. relative to our government, not our private sector, right? I think That's you, right. Right. We fail fast, fail often in the government all the, in the private sector all the time. Right. 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 Well, so, I mean policy experiments. Yeah, policy from experiments. Government okay, all right. Perspective. So, so, so yeah. let's talk about that for a second because, <laughs> right, there was an era, right, and 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 Megan sort of referenced it. You referenced it, right, where the U.S. government was very innovative, right, and and it tolerated a lot of failures. It was the Apollo program, right? Yeah. We failed and failed and failed again yeah. because we wanted to rapidly innovate. Is is there a need for a? I mean, we've talked about oh, the government needs a pivot and we need to, we need to support failure and, the, and like it has not happened. And, and I'm going to come to you, Megan, on this because DOD is the one place where it's a it's a train wreck because no failure is tolerated, right? All, or very little failure is tolerated, except in the most innovative parts of DOD, right? Special forces, right, and the like. So, Dan, is your view that the government ought be significantly more tolerant of failure, fail fast, fail often, in these spaces where it's making these investments, make a lot of smaller investments? Because right now we're doing the opposite. Mm. Right? Our current big investment theory is billions of dollars to establish industries to build up. Is that the wrong approach? Yeah, it's hard to say. I can, I can only say that sort of from a very high level perspective, I think the fact that they are willing, the government is willing to, to tolerate more failures in policy experiments will provide them some advantages because you know, they can catch up, potentially leapfrog, develop new technologies and roll them out much quicker than they can in the US. So it's hard to say beyond that okay. sort of at a more granular so, level what to do. So Megan and John, I'm, I'm coming back to you in just a second, but, but, but Megan, talk to us about uh, the, the sort of the question in the Department of Defense, right? So I don't mean to put you in your in a former role, but I will. Um, you know, one of the places where we're just not good at at doing some of this stuff is DoD, right? Big programs of record, right? Um, a huge innovation, in the IP happening, but very little of that actually making it to war fighters and and making it in the space. And yet, one of our biggest tools we're using to 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 you know do industrial policy. Right, besides the big investment we're about to make in Department of Commerce, right, billions of dollars to industry, is the Defense Production Act. Is 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 DOD and the Defense Production Act a way that we can actually innovate, or is it just gonna be more the same big defense contractors, programs of record, and no real innovation? So I'm I'm smiling a little because I I I've spent a lot of wonderful years in DOD and, and know the halls of the Pentagon very well, and the bureaucracy there is just um, just mind blowing. Uh, it is. It is. And and so this has been, you know, a lot of people um, who who work in defense acquisition and, and research uh, recognize this problem of uh, just being mired in the DoD acquisitions bureaucracy and the need to change it. Uh, but but making changes in that bureaucracy is uh, just good luck. Good luck to any poor soul who wades into that and tries to, because uh, I, I will say that the tables just need to be flipped. And um, and we're we're a little ways a long ways off from being able to accomplish that. The parochial interests, uh, the program interests, the long-standing programs, um, entrenched programs, um, and uh, and acquisition channels are just just so so deeply entrenched. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen a path forward to recreating that. Uh, I mean, I, I think the processes need to be recreated. Um, I'm, you know, people talk, sort of reference the valley of death um, and being able to transition a lot of great research going. The, the DOD certainly is moving into new, new ways to touch um, startups and, um, um, you know, small, small businesses out in Silicon Valley. And, but then transitioning that into the DOD and bringing it in is, right. a, is a whole different matter. Yeah. Um, so we lose that. We lose that transition. And guess who benefits from it? China, right? China, exactly um, China is absolutely adept at swooping in and picking up programs that the DoD leaves behind, um, and so we have programs that are funded funded by DoD that Sivers then benefit, programs. right? Right. That then um, China China swoops in and, and benefits from them. So we just need to figure out a different way to pull in those those innovative programs. Not uh, we need to figure a way to pull them in. Regardless, just because that's where innovation is happening in today's technological ecosystem, um, but then we need to, to figure out a way to even if we don't go that route to keep to yeah. keep China um, from pulling them in. Um, and again, I think it's a long term it's a long term issue that we need to address yeah. um, in, in reconfiguring the Pentagon. 
Yeah. So, John, so we're making some of these investments, right? We're, we're going to something of a more, at least a centralized funding model at some level, right? Um, but you've heard now from Megan and Dan about the problems in the government being innovative or even, even, even seeking to acquire innovative technology, right? There's all these touch points with DOD and the Defense Indu you know, Innovation Unit up in the Silicon Valley. There's AFWorks, SoftWorks, you name it. But they can't seem to actually do anything with all this innovation, right? How do we... How do we get the government to where Dan's talking about? Can we get the government, is it, does it even make sense to get the government back in a mode of rapid innovation, working with industry effectively? I mean, we've talked about it for decades, right? Oh, we need to be more innovative. We gotta work clo more close with industry. The problem is it seems like the government always go back to the same, the same folks, whether it's, whether it's big defense contractors, or in this case, big semiconductor players, right? Or, or big technology, right? And in, sometimes those companies are, large new companies, right? Google, Amazon, like Microsoft was new once, but it doesn't seem like the government is good at acquiring and working with these smaller players who've got that edgy innovation. Can we solve, is that even a solvable problem? And what does your research in the, in the in private industry tell us about that? Well, it's, um, um, as we say in trial, objection compound. Yeah, um, that was, there were, a lot, <laughs> there were like eight questions and I'll admit that, I'll admit it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the examples that I draw on actually is, is 160 years old, um, which was back when the United States was an agricultural country and um, the government was trying to decide whether how to um, improve its agricultural output. And so the thing that it, that it did was invest in land-grant colleges. So basically every state in the country has at least one college that was a university that was set up specifically for the purpose of um, conducting uh, agricultural experimentation and improving crop yields, um, and, well, crop, animal husbandry, all aspects of agriculture. Um, and one of the important uh, dimensions of that university was, that, was the um, extension program. The extension program was people who were, whose job it was to take the results of the university and go out and talk to farmers explain, you know, talk to the farmers about what they wanted, talk to the farmers about what was had been discovered in the lab, um, you know, at, at uh, you know, Cornell or wherever it was, uh, the, each one of the universities, and make sure that there was a relatively tight linkage between what people wanted and what the government was producing. Now, this was mostly applied research. You don't think of this as being, you know, like basic science. So they've increasingly become, it's be, it increasingly has become basic science. But the point of it was there was a tight coupling between the people who use the technology and the people who develop the technology, and the extension agents were an indispensable part of that. So if you think about that, one of the things that needs to happen is when people are creating information, the guys who are really good, the, the ladies and gentlemen, who are really good at creating new information aren't necessarily the ones who are really good at applying it. And the ones who are really good at applying it aren't necessarily the ones who can create it. So what you need is a coupling of the people who discover information and the people who use information. And that's something that we've historically been poor at. Yeah. I agree with Dan that you know, the, the basic research, um, it, the United States is, is a leader in basic research and we should actually increase our basic research, but it doesn't do a lot of good to do basic research unless you're finding a way to get that linked to the private sector. The, this was a problem that we had back in 1980 with the Bayh-Dole Act. There was lots of university research that was not being commercialized, and the reason why was because you couldn't get um, patents on it. This was when I undergra um, graduated from undergraduate school, you know, back when the dinosaurs uh, emerged. The question was, what's happening to university research and what's the level of patenting by the universities? It was very, very small, and Bayh-Dole freed that up. It allowed people to invest in to put private sector investments into publicly funded research. And this is why one of the, um, the, the waning of IP is actually so detrimental because it makes it harder for people to take um, publicly funded research and create private property out of it. There's actually a culture which says that's terrible. The whole march in rights debate is, oh, the public funded it, therefore um, we own it, we shouldn't be paying anything for it. Well, the public funded part of it but somebody actually had to figure out how to get it to market. And so we as a culture need to tolerate the um, exploitation of publicly funded research by people who are actually good and going out and producing better products with it. And that's something that, along with the attack on IP itself, is also um, uh, a, I think, a step backwards yeah. relative to the, the thinking that we had 40 years ago.
Well, what about that, Dan? I mean, it, it, I mean that sounds right. It, if, you, if you allow people to create innovation, whether it's funded by the government or not, that's interesting and terrific, right? But if you don't commercialize it and make it practically applicable, right, who cares, right? And so if that's right, then um, it suggests we gotta, we gotta protect IP rights, we gotta defend them more effectively, and then the government's gotta be willing to allow those who've innovated to then take it and do something useful with it, right? Not just lock it up only. And by the way, that has an impact on government IP rights, which the government demands lots of sort of preference and the like in some of the IP it, it, it generates. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think John and I are in consensus there in terms of, you know, there's a, there's a time and a place for basic research, but it absolutely needs to be connected with applied research. And in many ways, China actually, I think, excels, as I said before, in, in applied research. I could, I could talk more generally, actually, about sort of China's innovation capacity. Yeah, Because maybe, you know, I, I think uh, for context, this could be helpful for, for the audience. I definitely agree with John. You have this real disconnect between these patent indicators in China, right? Millions of patents filed. Uh, and the quality of those patents. You know, there's shortcomings of patent-related indicators, but as John said, you know, there's this huge system of subsidies in the country, which has existed for two decades now. Uh, I co-authored a, a book on this point, so I could tell you a lot of nitty-gritty details about how these subsidies work. You can go, for example, to the Beijing government, get a certain amount of subsidies, and they're not just covering official filing costs, right? They're covering maintenance fees, they're costing attorney fees. Uh, they can be a very large sum of money, so more like a grant. Then you could also go to sort of a district government in Beijing and get these subsidies, right? So they're making out with an incredible amount of money from these subsidies over time. So absolutely, this, amongst a number, a number of other factors, is leading to this inflation of the, the patent numbers. I can go into more detail, and but I'll just, spare just you. You're talking about yeah. subsidies to get patents. Yeah. So Increase the numbers the way that, the way that John yeah. has talked about. Yeah, so, uh, for, so for example, these subsidies, again, they're not just covering the official filing right. costs of patents, right? Sometimes they're given in lump sums. So again, they can cover the costs of attorneys, mm -hmm. you know, prosecuting the patents. They can cover maintenance fees. Sometimes they're just a giant lump sum not targeted towards any particular expenditure. You can get them from multiple levels, levels of government, right? So you're getting a huge amount of money, in some cases, just to file a patent. Literally, you get the application number, and then you still get the money, right? Over time, they've tried to reform these different systems, and these are at the provincial level, by the way, 31 different provinces in China. So there's a huge amount of complexity. They tried it to make these safeguards in these types of uh, financial instruments more strict, right? At least you have to get a granted patent, for example, to get these kind of benefits and so on. Um, but they've had a lot of issues there. Recently, they tried to sort of completely scrap this system. But to be honest, uh, you know, it's very difficult for a number of reasons. You may perceive China as sort of a, a well-organized sort of uh, beast, if you will, with a central level government dictating everything. That's not really how it works in the country. Uh, you have this administrative decentralized system where provincial level governments and local governments are meant to implement different types of policies. Sometimes they deviate for any number of reasons from central level guidance. So it's a huge complex system if they'll actually sort of move away from these financial subsidies and things for patenting uh, remains to be, to be seen. Another important thing is that they've actually set targets, performance evaluation targets for government officials, managers in state-owned enterprises, uh, and researchers working in universities, public research institutes for numbers of patents they have to produce every year. Straight quantity. Yeah, straight quantity. 10,000, for example, uh, patent applications need to be filed in X province this year, yeah. right? So you can imagine these, the financial incentives, the performance evaluations, and then something else which hasn't been mentioned is the types of patents available in China, right? So over 50% of the applications in China in recent years are for designs and utility model patents. That's different from a utility patent in the US. In the US, basically, what we would consider a utility patent, they consider what they call an invention patent. A utility model patent is not something that all countries have. In China, its maximum duration of protection is 10 years. Uh, it has no you know, full substantive examination, has a lower inventive step requirement. Um, you can only protect uh, products, not processes, and so on. But you can imagine that in that situation, where you have essentially a patent that you just apply for, there's no real substantive examination, low standard if it was even examined, combined with these performance evaluations and the subsidies, this is a recipe for, as John mentioned, this huge inflation of, of, of the numbers of patents in China and, and hence a disconnect with the, the quality of innovation. So I definitely agree with John. I, I don't want to drone on, but I would say uh, at the same time, despite that, despite looking in patenting indicators, China actually is relatively innovative in many ways, based upon a number of other indicators, right? If we look at, for example, scores on uh, 
math and science, which is one indicator that uh, WIPO and some other organizations use uh, in their global innovation index. China scores number one, the US scores 24. In terms of uh, R&D, or rather in STEM PhDs, China graduates the most. In terms of you know, scientific articles they lead, in terms of highly cited articles, they're sort of up there with the US. Um, Surveys of Western executives, actually, you know, by PwC, by foreign industry associations. In recent years, they've said that over 60% of respondents say that, you know, Chinese companies are as innovative as we are, or in some cases, even more innovative, right? In terms of, uh, as I mentioned, applied research and development, they're sort of roughly in the same level of expenditures at the US, although the US is ahead in basic research and development, right? The, the list goes on. And if you look at the company level, I could drone on about all different types of innovative companies. In China, also uh, in some spaces, for example, where you know, other entities like the Chinese Academy of Sciences is, ex is excelling in new materials, quantum communications, and so on. So there is a lot of innovation despite this, and I agree completely with John, there is this disconnect between patent quantity and patent quality, but we should not forget that there is real innovation coming out of China, and that has real competitive implications for the US companies and, and the US more broadly. Well, John, I want to follow up with something Dan said, and then I want to, I want to come bring a conversation back to national security, since that is one of the topics of our, of our panel. Uh, but I do want to ask about something, something Dan said, which is um, you know, this idea that, um, that there's these huge numbers of patents right, that are being granted, and you talked about that and the quantities and, and, and the perhaps lack of quality. What implications does that have for innovation? Because you might imagine a world in which too many patents being granted is actually negative on innovation because people are being boxed out in ways that aren't actually genuine because they're weak, they're weak patents. Is that something we see happening in China? And if so, what does that tell us? And then second, and I, again, a compound question, um, I'm interested to know what impact does this huge number of patents that are being granted have on the international patenting regime, right? Is it, because presumably that some of these are being filed internationally as well as in China. And if so, is it weakening the international IP regime and what impact does it have there? Um, yeah, so those, those are good questions. I mean, I think it's, uh, I'd answer the first one by saying a patent is a right to exclude. And so the question is, are people uh, being excluded more in China? Right. Are there things, and, uh, and the answer is, I don't think that there is serious evidence of that. So it's just a flood of patents with no real enforcement effect, so it doesn't actually have an impact. Well, you do, I mean, you, you do have an increasing amount of Chinese patent litigation. In fact, I okay. think there's probably more patent litigations in China uh, than in the US, but the, um, the effect of those litigations, for example, damages awards, are right. still quite small. So you can't, it, it, it's highly unusual, uh, it's in, uh, increasingly unusual in the US to have a high damages award, yeah. but it's very, very unusual, just unheard of to have an uh, award of significant amounts of money where somebody's actually shut out of a market because they infringe a patent in China. They're can, usually yeah. very narrow. Well, can I ask about that then? So, and sorry to interrupt, but um, so, you know, I was, I was a, econ major for half my time at UCLA, but that was a million years ago. Um, strikes me though that that would create a lot of deadweight loss, right? Because what you have is you have this litigation, more litigation, not real awards, doesn't really change the innovation dynamic. And so what you have is a bunch of lawyers on both sides make a ton of money. And as a recovering lawyer myself, right, might be good for the, for the business, but bad for the economy. This is probably the wrong place to attack lawyers. I, listen, I hear you. you use I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm recovering with myself. So, but what do you think? Um, uh, well, I mean, I mean, litigation is horribly inefficient. Right. Thank God, that's how my kids are going to college. Um, <laughs> that's right. You are but, a litigation consultant, <laughs> so testifying at, 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 you know, assume high rates. I, I'm. I'm uh, um, anyway, we're talking about Chinese but, litigation, right? Litigation well, yeah. in China over the millions of patents. I, I think million plus patents. I, I think there would be a lot of well, so the. Um, the costs of litigation are, are what they are. I think that the, the, and that's probably inefficient. The question is, are people actually, be, are, is, are all these patents leading to um, increased concentration and monopolization in China? And I think the answer to that question is no. Okay, so if I infringe your patent, you've gotta pay me $50,000, or I've gotta pay you $50,000, and then I, but your patent is so narrow that um, I can keep doing what I'm doing by, inventing around quite yeah. easily. So it's, it's not a valuable patent, even though I did manage to get $50,000 out of you. The, the, their system, I mean, I think Dan's right, is that one of the advantages of this is that they are innovating so fast in terms of things like patent litigation. Mm -hmm. Their system is moving so rapidly in 20 years 
uh, from a, a place where they didn't know how to file a patent suit, basically, yeah. to lots and lots and lots and lots of people are, are uh, able to engage in litigation. It's low value litigation, yeah. but they're acquiring the skills and they're build, they're laying the foundation for a much more accomplished intellectual property system. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I don't want to again minimize the future threat just because the cases today are not worth that much. Yeah. On on the international front, just to quickly answer your second question, um, uh, it's actually quite interesting that the number of domestic Chinese patent applications does not translate into uh, foreign applications. So if, so if you ask yourself, um, I, I wrote my PhD thesis on this, and so if you ask yourself... I didn't um, know that, by the way. Right, <laughs> well, I won't bore you with it. But the, um, uh, if you ask, one of the uh, indicators of patent quality is the breadth of patent protection that people uh, choose for a given invention. And most inventions are, not, are only filed in the home country, and uh, relatively few are filed broadly. Chinese firms file... Um, in fewer countries than other firms. And so if you believe that that's an indicator of quality, it's uh, so like in telecom, for example, the average number of countries in which a uh, Chinese uh, telecom manufacturers file is less than European and US telecom right. um, innovators. And so uh, if they were as high quality innovations, you would expect to see uh, just you know, five times as much filing in the US and in Europe as you do in China, and that doesn't happen. Um, similarly, when you look at uh, foreign filing in China, um, it is increasing, but not nearly as rapidly as Chinese filing in China because it's not subsidized. So the Chinese economy is growing, patents are becoming more important there, but it's growing at the rate of, you know, like 5% a year, not 25% per year, like so domestic I filings. Thought, I would have thought the reason, at least the reason that, you know, when, when, when I was in a startup and we didn't file our patents in China was because we didn't think they'd be enforced. Right. right. We thought it would just increase the likelihood they would take the innovations and not enforce. And so to me, it was less, to us at least, it, our theory was less about, oh, you know, it's additional costs or whatever. They'll, you know, it was more, they'll just take the technology. I mean, they're already going to see it in U.S. patent filings, but we'll file it there and then they won't, they, they won't enforce it. Is well, that, so this, this, is, this is part of the sort of misguided competitor narrative, you know. So one of the things that happens in real world negotiations yeah. where people are negotiating over global patent portfolios as they are in standard essential patents is um, uh, a Chinese firm will, uh, and, and Chinese courts, will look at the number of patents held in China as being an indicator of the rate that you should be able to command in China. And if you don't file in China, then you'll get a lower rate and you'll get a lower, you'll either have to give them a discount in China, which of course is where everything is manufactured, yeah. or you'll have to take a lower global rate. So there's kind of this, part of the, the big bear narrative is I've got lots of meaningless Chinese patents, but that helps me when it comes to mm -hmm. negotiating if people believe that's important, even though you might believe, your company didn't think it was important, we don't think it's important, but if a Chinese court thinks it's important, it's important. Yeah, yeah. John, uh, Dan, <laughs> sorry. I, I could comment more generally, I think, on the IP uh, institutions and sort of the IP risk yeah. in China, if, if now is the time. I mean, I agree with John. I, I think there's a lot of, of these patents out there that essentially, you know, so what, in a sense, right? Of course, there are some costs, right? Companies like to do freedom to operate analyses as they well should, particularly when you're talking about utility model patents, you know, with such a low inventive step requirement and so many of them, again, you know, over you know, 50% of the patents in China being filed right now are utility models or designs. It can be complicated to invalidate them, and there's a number of other rules sort of in place that present, mo prevent sort of mosaicing of prior art. So it's, those can be particularly difficult to deal with, but I think for the most part, they're not clogging up sort of yeah. proportionately, if you will, uh, sort of uh, freedom to operate and in, in inventions and things like that. But in terms of the IP system in China, which certainly enforcement, which is one thing that was just mentioned, is part of, uh, I think uh, a, a few points should be made. First is obviously, you know, it's no surprise that there's a high uh, IP infringement risk still in China, right? And I'm talking about in China, you know, you talk about cyber hacking and things that are happening outside of China, that's, that's another issue. But that should be no surprise. I think the sophistication of that has probably uh, be, be sort of increased over the years. So in the past, you know, you could go to China and find a a cane, yeah, like a Canon sort of, you know, uh, camera, right, with knockoff of Canon and, and a Nokia phone, these types of things. It's gotten, it's gotten more sophisticated uh, in many senses, right? There's an incredible amount now, of French. Now a Huawei router <laughs> is just a Cisco router in a different yeah. box. <laughs> so, 
Perhaps, you know, perhaps they added something new to that as well, right? Well, no, they so. are, to be fair, they are innovating. That's the, well, that's the real problem, right? Yeah. They're stealing all this huge investment in R&D, and I will use the word stealing, right? Other people might not, right? But then they're innovating on top of it, which is almost worse. They don't have to make that basic investment. This, as you well know, I mean, we could go with a history lesson and see countries around the world that have done that throughout their history. So it shouldn't be surprising at a mini minimum. I'm not sort of justifying We just took ethically. the lamp. <laughs> right, I'm not justifying it ethically. But uh, anyway, there's a lot of infringement, obviously. But I, I think the point needs to be made that the IP institutions in China are actually a pretty decent quality. That may be shocking to some people. And we talk about laws, right? You talk about administration. You talk about enforcement. You talk about other policies. In many senses, you look at the letter of the law, you look at its application, you talk to practitioners, do surveys and so on. It's comparable in many ways, to be frank, with, with the US today. Not necessarily, certainly not 10 years ago, but today, or some places in Europe. And in fact, perhaps surprisingly, there are a few aspects of the system where I would say it actually offers rights holders more appropriability at lower cost than the US. And I don't say this to be sensationalist. You heard it here first. I, mean, I don't say this to be sensationalist, but just to give some perspective, because I, certainly with the trade war, you know, narrative and things like that, I think people really think China is sort of a black hole. So for example, in the area of law, um, you know, you have non-compete agreements, which can be enforced and are legal. That's not the case in some US states, as you, as you well know. California. In terms of- They sure, are, of course, here in Virginia, as I learned, by sure, the way. Sure, sure, sure. Well, it, it matters a lot in California, right? You got Silicon Valley and so on. If you look at uh, IP law and also administration, right, there's fatter, faster patent pendency for invention patents in China than in the US. If you look at enforcement, obviously, you know, there's lower, uh, court costs, lower attorney costs, time to rulings, quick, more, uh, faster in China. If you look in the area of patent trolls, because they don't have discovery and because rel they have relatively low damages, which is a double-edged sword, obviously, you have, again, a lower risk of patent trolling in China. Um, foreign companies, whenever they do bring litigation, perhaps you'd be surprised that they, the vast majority of times they do win. Now, there's obviously a, a protectionist judgments here or there that, that doesn't sort of, sort of devalue the, the, the problem there, but nonetheless, that, I think that should be said. And even in recent years, they've introduced sort of a, a patent licensing platform, na nationwide patent licensing platform as part of their um, revised patent law. So again, to put things in perspective, it's you know, really, to be honest, the institutions are not that bad. Then the, the obvious question becomes, you know, how can you have this disconnect between all this infringement and then the good quality institutions. And there's probably a few explanations for that, but one is there's this gap, and sort of a temporal gap between the time it takes to actually have uh, these institutional changes take effect. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. As John said, you know, it's, they have a much larger population than the US, so per capita the risk is gonna be higher. They have much more contract manufacturing than the US. Per capita, the risk is gonna be higher, right? It's also a very complex country. As I mentioned before, it's not just central government as we'd like to think, central government says what you, you should do, and everybody follows it. You have extremely different geographical regions in the country, di very different levels of income, right? You go to Shanghai versus Gansu, completely different places, right? There's different incentives at the local level for government officials in terms of how much they want to invest, what kind of capabilities they have to invest to actually implement reform. So it's, it's a very complicated system, and I, and I don't think we should uh, oversimplify it. Well, so, and we are going to take questions from the audience here in just a second, but Megan, I want you to bring us back for a second. So, you know, we just heard from Dan this idea that, well, maybe, you know, the institutions are solid, and maybe over time China will reform or become better, become a better player in the IP space and the like. I mean, look, we had this theory before, right? There was this theory that if we just brought, you know, capitalism to China, right, democracy would flourish and human rights would be well protected and, you know, they'd become a good participant in the in the world economy. And that really hasn't played out. So I'm a little, you know, culturally skeptical, Dan, on, on the theory, right? Mm -hmm. But talk to us for a second, uh, Megan, about, um, you know, this question of, we've talked a lot about intellectual property, we've talked a lot about innovation. All this sounds like economics, right? Why does any of this matter to our national security. Like we, we've heard now in the last few years, right? And we've seen with the pandemic and, you know, pharmaceutical precursors and, 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 you know, and now automotive chips and the like, we've seen some talk about national security. The Chips Act was all about that, right? What's the national security nexus when it comes to this is issue of innovation and intellectual property? Uh, so I'd point, it's actually uh, sort of a, an easy onward pointer to, to a speech recently made by Jake Sullivan um, yeah. at the um, uh, Special Competitive Strategies Project um, 
Global Emerging Technology Conference. I was late um, and missed his speech. I got there right after it was over. So I, told, I texted him and I'm like, I missed so, your speech. You're still here? And he's like, God. Fabulous speech and very, so anyone who is interested and involved in the geopolitics of, of technology, a very important speech. Uh, we in industry were watching very closely because uh, sort of for what what is the government's policy going to be moving forward on semiconductors and export controls? Yeah. Everyone's breathlessly watching for this for for clues, and he provided some. Um, and this is so, the question, then, by the way, of tooling whether we're going to sell tooling to exactly, China. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. So so a couple of important points just to to point to in his remarks, and it gets to this exact question. Um, of course, in in the last administration, uh, when I was in the NSC, we started to hear. Economic security is national security. I think we first yeah. saw that in the national security strategy. Um, and so now that's sort of a buzz phrase, and we all say that, and it's sort of a throwaway phrase. Right. Um, and uh, But it's nonetheless a new concept, uh, relatively speaking. So what does that translate into in terms of policy? So, so Jake Sullivan, uh, the national security advisor, said last week on this issue of, of these um, foundational technologies, and for anyone familiar with export controls, that's a loaded term, um, foundational and emerging technologies, but um, that these are, he described them as force multipliers, yeah. um, and specifically pointed to three technology areas, computing technologies, um, certainly semiconductors are in that space, but enabling the digital infrastructure, telecommunications, and that uh, sort of thing. Secondly, biotechnologies. Mm -hmm. And then third, clean energy. Um, and so, so he had to throw that third one in. He had to throw that third one in. But from a national security perspective, you think renewable, renewable energies right. and that sort of thing that that are certainly significant from a national defense and military capabilities perspective. So, so force multiplier technologies. Uh, you think point look at these technologies that are in certainly um, your your jet engines and aerospace capabilities are national security critical. But that's a that's sort of at the top of the food chain. So going going down to the very bottom of that, you see these technologies that are intrinsic in each of these military um, capabilities, and you're finding um, computing capabilities, biotech, and, and energy. Um, so, so force multiplier technology, and he's saying we're going to take a very different approach on these technologies. No longer are we going to be applying a sliding scale, Yeah. but this is an absolute. Uh, which is a shift in U.S. policy. So that that is very interesting for those sort of looking to what are we going to be seeing in the future. Um, but me, you know, as a as a Marine um, and from from the DoD and national security community, is I want the at the the very most competitive domestic industrial ecosystem, um, especially now that we are pulling defense technologies out of the commercial side, the purely commercial sector, right. out of Silicon Valley uh, for artificial intelligence, drone technology. Um, Unmanned, unmanned vehicles, and all of these are coming out of the private sector. So to have uh, the most robust, healthy, vibrant, competitive uh, domestic ecosystem is, a, you know, it's one and the same, yeah. uh, absolutely, to national security. Um, so, so I would again point point to that speech yeah. and um, and very very interesting times on policy. Yeah. And for those of you who haven't who haven't seen, it's all online. The Strategic Competitive Studies Project. Um, in part funded by uh, uh, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. Um, really an amazing event. It was a one-day event. They probably packed five days of conference into a single day. It was really um, astounding. So I highly recommend it to folks. Um, uh, one, uh, one thing I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention up front, which is I don't know if you all noticed, but we didn't have opening statements on this panel. Um, we went straight to questions. So I'm going to ask those who are up asking questions to do the same thing. Don't make a statement and say thoughts, right? Ask a real question. We'll get, I'll get the panel to answer it, but give us real questions. All right, sir, in the front. Well, I'm going to have to start off with a comment. I'm sorry. Um, Dan correctly pointed out that we, uh, in the press, called China evil. I think we have to be real careful, because when we compete, we're going to need friends and allies outside the nation. OK? Sure. They know our history. They know that we had genocide against the Native Americans that were here and eliminated them. They know we abused the black population of slaves. So we have to be very careful pointing fingers because we've got skeletons in our own closet. OK, point number one. Point number two, we, are doing, we have set the gold standard of how to innovate. OK? China has to catch up to us, not the other way around. OK? We, we have so much interaction between the private sector, government, and academics. Okay, that has built up a whole culture of helping each other to bring innovations to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you talk about pumping so much money into basic research, nothing turning, turning into applied. That's nonsense, total nonsense, okay? Technology transfer out of the academic community has brought, uh, it's been documented, 200 uh, drug innovations into the hands of companies that have turned it into FDA approved drugs. Airplanes, Dan mentioned the, the whole list of things. So we're doing well, we need friends and allies, we have to be very, very careful. And lastly, I'd like to, the question is this. I want to expand the conversation a little bit. We need to compete with them because they're competing with us. Great. But there's another element to this. We need to cooperate with them. Why? Because we've got global issues in the climate. They pump more carbon into the air than anybody else. And we can reduce all the carbon we want in this country if they keep pumping out carbon. We have to cooperate with them. So this idea of we need to compete with them, yes, but we need to balance that with the fact that there needs to be a tremendous amount of cooperation that goes on in certain sectors. We need to be kicking each other under the table in the shins as far as competition, but we also have to be cooperating openly and freely. So I'd like to ask the question, how do you see this cooperation? Do you agree with this? That yeah, we need to compete, but we also have to cooperate. Yes or no? Yeah. So let's. Uh, this is a great question. So let's talk about it. I'll just go down. I'll just go down the road. I'll start with you, Megan. So, so one of the arguments that that uh, that our that our audience member uh, raises is, look, you know, we got this great competition going on. It is what it is, right? Um, and you know, we could take our lumps on on how we treated the Native Americans and 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 the Black African population. They're interning a million Uyghurs, right? We can we compete about what's worse, right? Um, uh, but let's talk about cooperation, right? Green energy. We can't solve our pro the world's problems without the Chinese coming on board. Are they going to get on board? Is that even a real possibility? Or are they going to make commitments, which we've seen them do, and then blow right through them because that's the nature of the business? Thoughts on that, Megan? Sure. So um, I, uh, having been in the government and the policy community, I would say this certainly has been the the interest of the of the administration of, of several administrations is to cooperate wherever possible. Uh, we're seeing, but but however, that said, it's sort of few and far between for those reasons, which are entirely accurate. That there's sort of a level of trust needing to maintain a level of trust between governments, and uh, so in 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 previous um, decades, you know, we had this U.S. policy of enabling China's peaceful rise. Yeah. Um, and Didn't work out. It, it didn't exactly work out. And so this sort of sense of, and, and in fact, speaking from the, from the DOD perspective, where we had military cooperation and, uh, and programs to facilitate, facilitate improved engagements between countries that you sort of, frankly, feel burned. Yeah. Feel burned. And so, you know, having gone through a period of that, then there's this, there's this you know, withdrawal both sides. So now we're limited to areas of cooperation, like on climate, um, you know, that, that tend to be not as, not as critical from a national security perspective, certainly, um, but trying to find those areas of common ground yeah. where we can at least, but then, again, maintaining that trust um, that we're going to achieve, achieve the goals that we set out to achieve. It's just, unfortunately, we're moving in the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, but I think that still is very much the, the objective of the government, of this, yeah. of this administration, to to try, to try, yeah. but unfortunately, China's not making it very easy. Dan, any any more positive or John, any more positive spin on that? I'm, I'm hoping Dan, you might, you might, you know, your institutional view. Maybe is there is there is there a hope on carbon for China? Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think. How did I know that was the answer I was going to get? <laughs> yes. I, I mean, they. Uh, I'm not an expert in this area of green technology, for example, but there, it's sort of an imperative, at a minimum, from a business sort of perspective that they invest more in, in green techs and, and roll it out in the country. And they're seeing, you know, that, that it's financially a, a very smart thing to do. It's not just Because their purchasers for, want it or no, because? No, be, because they need to, to sort of economize on, on cost. They can't mm. just continue to pollute. The people won't accept it at a certain point, right? So there's a, a strong business case to be made in any country, mm. I think, for investing in more green technologies. And China is doing it. They've got some really strong companies, you know, Goldwind and so on in green technology. So I think there should be cooperation to the extent, I agree it's difficult, I'm not gonna sugarcoat that, it's very difficult in a lot of areas. 
Um, I think the, the you know, you, from, you, from a high level sort of industrial organization perspective, there's certain industries that are more, more prone to what we call competition, right? Yeah. So basically, you have competition, but you also have some collaboration. And yeah. You could go into high, sit and nail buff. Yeah, you can go into, you know, high entry barriers, but then low sort of bargaining power suppliers and, and buyers and so on. So I think perhaps green tech could be, could be there's certain industries that fit that bill. In terms of how sort of we make this relationship work, I'm not going to say it's easy. Yeah. But I think the obvious thing is, for US companies, US research institutions, to make sure that they are at the cutting edge and actually providing something useful. Because yeah. then there is a need to continue to collaborate in some form. Even you can question their motives, but there will be some kind of collaboration. Yeah. And frankly, that's what we should expect from our companies as well, not to be complacent and hide behind yeah. vested interest and so on, and just ride out some kind of innovation wave for longer than they, than they should. John, any thoughts on that? Um, I don't think our goal should be to beat China. Hmm. Um, I don't think our objective should be to demonize China. I think that the United States is, a, is unusual in the history of the world um, because we believed in freedom. And we believe that freedom is a fundamental human right. And I think that it's actually too low of a goal to beat China. What we should do is continue to we, we should continue to be the city on the hill that John Winthrop said when he came here uh, in the 17th century, uh, and just as much for Chinese people as for anybody else. I think we should be inviting all those PhDs from Shanghai to come to the U.S. and build something that they can't build in China here. Here, yeah, absolutely. You know, be, be, and and do that out of the conviction that. Um, we have created an environment for individual yeah. human flourishing, and it doesn't, at some level, it doesn't matter whether it's the United States flourishing, you know, Americans, it's it, what matters is human flourishing, and we're committed to human flourishing in the United States. That's, that's who we are, and we want that for any, everybody. So I feel like, um, you know, Jefferson said about the British, they're enemies in war, but in peace, friends. Yeah. So there are areas where China, China has picked a fight. And if they're going to fight, then we're going to win. Yeah. But that's not a, it's not personal. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a conflict not of our own choosing. Yeah. And, and then I guess, I, and I, so I guess the, the one thing I would say as an economist, which at some level is a second order thing, but it also can be the first order thing, we had a similar problem with Russia during the Cold War. And it was inefficient to have to win the Cold War with a defense buildup that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union. But it ended up eliminating some, a, a, a system that was fundamentally counterproductive yeah. to us and to the Russian people. The one drawback with that is we did not commit ourselves to paying back the cost of that buildup. We, we went into debt for it. It was a great expenditure. We should have paid it off. And since then, we've gone into increasing debt. With, uh, and our ability, our ability as a country, even though we're the richest country in the world, our ability to continue to fight that war or collaborate or do anything else is being constrained by our national yeah. debt. And that, that to me, is um, a, a black mark on the American soul, because we are compromising the ability of our children to Compete or fight, however you want, whatever, yeah. or collaborate because we're we haven't paid for our past yeah. consumption. It is interesting that you talk about you know the sort of our, our policy when it comes to you know we bring in so many students from overseas, we educate them in some of the best schools here in the United States, and then we force them to leave and go back home and innovate in their own. I mean, it's, it's literally a catastrophically bad policy. Um, and when you add that to the fact that we're going into massive amounts of debt to these foreign countries that are buying our yes. debt, it makes no sense. Um, and you look at somebody, you know, if you look at Ronald Reagan, right, he, he talked about cutting the debt, right? He, went, he brought us to that deficit, right? Talked about getting fiscal spending under control and how America was built on, right? The backs of immigrants in this country, right? Making this place a place where everybody could come, learn, educate themselves, and then build here and not go home to those other systems. Um, so it's a, it's a great point. Um, over here, yes, please. Thank you. So I'd like to try and bring together several strands I've seen this discussion specifically about the strategic paradigm, the short-term versus long-term sort of thing, right? So I would argue that in China there's more of a long-term gain. That's why actually the patent numbers are not a big deal. In addition to looking big and bear-like, right, 
there's this idea that, well, teleologically, we need that because that gets people thinking that intellectual property is important. And that's just the next step along the way for all those institutions that Dan talks about to really come to fruition. So my question would be then thinking about the phase one trade agreement. Phase one indicates that there might be a vision for something longer. Uh, what sort of a thing would you like to see in a phase two trade agreement if you'd even like to see a phase two trade agreement with China? Start on the far end. John, thoughts on a phase two trade agreement? Um, I've actually thought about this. Uh, I think I think that admitting China to the WTO with that, with you know sort of unconditionally, uh, rather than on a probationary basis, it probably means that as a practical matter, the the uh, um, horse has left the barn in terms of trying to reimpose conditions for trade with China. Um, uh, I, I don't. I don't think China would stand for it, and I just think it's it's impossible. I think that the second best solution to that is um, preferential treatment for um, the Pacific theater, um, for in particular for those countries that, um, in effect, were competing for Chinese uh, with the Chinese for the attention of you know the Malaysias and the Vietnams um, and uh, all the other uh, Asian countries, and I would. Um, I, I think we have, we don't really have sticks to play with, um, but we might have very well have carrots. And I would um, uh, want the U.S. to engage in leadership that um, gave preferential treatment to countries that didn't steal our intellectual property, for example. Um, and, uh, and I would think of a comprehensive trade framework that, that um, that was neutral, but that was not um, blind to the singular threats that we face with respect to China. Dan, Megan, Dan? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I would say that I think in the lead up to the trade war, you know, despite all its sort of disastrous consequences in many ways, there was some, some positive that came out in the area of intellectual property and even agreements around, for example, forced technology transfer policies with China, I could ramble on about this particular subject, but uh, uh, so there was some, some, certainly some value in that, really sort of putting into fruition something that had been in place a long time, you know, push from US government officials, EU government officials on a number of different policies related to new energy vehicles, uh, you know, foreign Sino joint ventures, technology import export regulations, a lot of things right around the, the, the period where this first trade war uh, or the trade agreement was signed, sort of change in Chinese legislation. So th there, to be frank, there are some positive uh, hmm. outcomes there. Um, and again, I could provide more details for those that are interested. In terms of what should go into this new trade agreement, I mean, perhaps a wish list that I'm not sure is, is very sort of uh, practical, but if you were to look at areas of sort of IP law in China, Despite what I said, that you know, in many ways the institutions are, are comparable to the U.S. There are certainly some short better at some level. I did, and absolutely, I stick to that. This, this is the difficult, and there was a point made earlier today. Got sort of pro IP, I think, at lunch. Pro IP or against IP? It's we all know it's much more nuanced than that, right? There's a lot of complex instruments in IP law, uh, but if we look in the area of law, for example, in China, uh, there's still a problem in litigation with secondary disclosure of trade secrets. I think there could be more clarification of the regulations in that. Space, that could be something that, that's mentioned in the agreement. Obviously, the last agreement, they had IP-specific provisions, so this could be practical. I'd like to see a search report required for utility models. That could perhaps go into there. I think more efforts should be done in terms of really encouraging judges to actually award higher damages in practice. You know, They've increased the statutory damages, for example, for patents and copyrights recently to around the equivalent of you know, 780,000 US dollars, something like that. Still not very high in practice. They're not really uh, even offering statutory damages at, at, at that level. Um, court orders, there should be more in terms of enforcing them, preservation of evidence, contempt of court, and so on. So th there, there's certainly some things that could be included in there. More generally, I think provisions on cooperation. You know, again, I'm not super optimistic you know, in terms of exactly how that will work, but some kind of technology cooperation. Um, you know, perhaps a crackdown as well on uh, the hacking that we see happening from Chinese entities outside of China, yeah, right? I, I mean, these are some things that come to mind. I'm sure a lot yeah. more could be sort of on the, on the table. Megan? Without going into too much specifics, I guess from an industry perspective, we'd love, we'd love nothing else than uh, successful and effective 
trade agreements, uh, phase one, phase two, phase five, between US and China to facilitate increased trade. Um, you know, the, the demand, the market in China for the semiconductor industry is significant, um, and we're moving now in a direction, the D word, the decoupling word that, that no, one want, no one in industry wants to see. Uh, that said, I think we still have a very, very long way to go on, on phase one, reach, reaching the objectives under the trade agreement uh, with, with regard to some, you know, the compulsory um, technology transfer and, and right. infringement on IP and, and cyber, um, cyber espionage. So um, perhaps I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a little cynical, but, but sort of, uh, you know, these are, these are very deep-seated and, and deeply entrenched um, issues. Um, that we need to address. So, um, and the record's not great. And the, rec the record is not great and not, not uh, moving in a positive right. trend. Right. OK, so Professor Jaffer, you actually touched on the subject I'm about to ask about. Great. You didn't quite go there. So what do we do policy-wise and legislatively about the sheer amount of loss we have of IP through graduate students? Mm. We train China's best and brightest. And they go home, and they use it against us. Point blank, I've watched this for 40 years since I was a grad student. I've seen it time and time again. I've been asked to litigate those cases, yeah. and it's hard. What do we do? Because there's no, in, I will grant you a lot of faculty I know at a lot of very well, Ivy League institutions will bitch and moan that they're not getting the best and brightest graduate students unless they're getting the best and brightest from China and elsewhere in India. But we don't do anything to make it even reasonable for Americans to go to graduate school. I have a son who just graduated UVA with honors. I can't tell him to go to graduate school. There's really no economic return. Yeah. You want to go to medical school? Fine. Get your MBA? Maybe. Probably. You want to become an engineer or a scientist? What's your real return? It's not good. Be a patent lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I have, I, I have three answers to that question, right? One, one, we, we have to build a STEM capability in the United States. We've talked, everyone knows, I mean, everyone's talked about it for a, mil a million years, right? Um, but there's no question we've got to do that, right? Number two, to the extent that Chinese students are coming here and being trained, we have to incentivize them to stay, right? We actually push them overseas by forcing them out, making it almost impossible to stay. We don't make it, I mean, our, our lack of, of effective protection of a lot of, a lot of uh, incentives for, for building a business today, right? Whether it's over taxation, over regulation, right? Bad IP incentives, right? We, putting aside even the immigration problem, which is, I mean, our immigration policy is catastrophically idiotic, right? And has been for decades. Um, I mean, we succeeded on the back of, of significant immigration to this country. My family came here from Tanzania, right? I mean, a first-generation immigrant to this country. So, you know, this idea that we're going to solve this by, by just keeping it all here and by building it domestically is idiotic. We've got to incentivize foreigners to come here, study here, and then stay and build their companies here, not in China, not in anywhere else. But um, that's at least my theory. I don't know. Megan? No, I absolutely agree. So, I mean, I don't think... We have a good answer for this yet, um, and, and speaking from the policy community, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, discussions about visa policies, STEM visas, yeah. um, certainly STEM yes. education. But gosh, I mean, that's from that's kindergarten decade, all the way. Yeah, that's right. that's a huge right. reformation. Um, but but needing to somehow incentivize. Of course, there are security concerns, um, and that is again for these security. There's no real good answer. Uh, these these technologies and the research is an export controlled, so that's not a clear hook. Um, so so there has to be you know, all those policy considerations have to be navigated. It's not a real good answer, but certainly from from my industry's perspective, workforce is a significant problem. We're going to be building the the ecosystem here. We need people to be able to work that ecosystem, um, and and we're having this exact this exact issue. So certainly, visa policy is a big one that we're trying to sort of motivate. Um, but then um, you have to be able to, from, from national security side, um, yeah. secure it on the back end. Yeah, I mean, look, identify, vet, admit. Yeah. Dan? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question, and I agree with, with what both of you said. I think, um, you know, to state the obvious, again, the STEM education, but not just the education per se. I think a lot more can be done in terms of, you know, whatever you want to call it, marketing or awareness right. building. Right to make STEM cool, you yeah, know? Yeah. I mean, today, no, no offense, then I clue myself in this group, you know, people grow up wanting to be lawyers or non-technical yeah, managers or, you know, athletes, right? I mean, people should be going to science fairs rather than high school football games. That would be nice. Yeah. 
to start at that level in, in the country and to build up own domestic talent. But in terms of um, you know, retaining Chinese talent, for example, not having them go back home, again, I mean, the, the immigration policy is a way, I think, again, and this is very soft, so it's hard to implement, but really building up a strong sense of patriotism in the country, yes. right? Not just for domestic people that were born here, but for immigrants, making them feel American. By the way, we're doing the opposite. We're, we're trending the opposite direction. It's trending the opposite direction. And, and even more with this division between the US and China, why would they want to stay when you're literally discriminated against on the street and you hear these kind of narratives uh, in the press? So it's, it's not conducive to, to having people stay. I would say if you look at China, there's an incredible amount of patriotism. Not saying there's not patriots in the US. Most certainly there are, right? But I would say, on average, Chinese people are much more patriotic, to be frank, than, 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 than Americans. And that can be a, a resource for the government there. I mean, in terms of the, the level of effort that people in Chinese Academy of Sciences or Huawei engineers put in to their innovation efforts, it's not just because they're capable and they're interested in it. They're literally working around the clock for a, a larger purpose. And it would be nice to foster that kind of ideology and that sort of identity here in the US, not just for people born here, but for Chinese uh, people coming to study. I mean, as well. that used to be American. Yeah. Right. John? <laughs> um, this, this is not meant to be a political statement. Um, we're, we're, we're right next to the nation's capital. Do it. <laughs> Just do it. Uh, fair enough. Well, in other words, I don't like the phrase make America great again. And the reason why I don't like it is because I feel like it's backwards looking. America became great not by looking backwards and trying to become great again. America became great by solving the problems that were in front of her. Yeah. And so um, uh, we have a lot of problems in front of us. And none of us is entitled to America's greatness. You know, uh, We have to get up every morning and solve the problems in front of us. And I feel like there's a huge, I see this in my children, You know, the, there's a almost a being rich is actually a curse in some ways. A hundred percent. You just you 100%. just think that, you know, my daughter said to me the other day, she said, uh, well, if I get this apartment, you know, it's too far from campus, I'll have to have a car. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know? Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure never, none of you has had that conversation with your kids. <laughs> You're um, not hungry anymore. Right? Well, that's, I mean, and the, I mean, I'm not trying to put, point a finger at anybody other than myself, no, I, but, the, but that, this is the point, is yeah. that we are not entitled to the title right. of superpower or world's greatest country, you need to roll up your sleeves and earn that in your right. own generation. And I, I don't know how you change that. I mean, yeah. it's almost like you need Jonathan Edwards to come here for another great awakening and say, you know, yeah. uh, you're like well, Reagan said, you know, we are one generation, freedom's one generation away from yeah. being lost. And I think that needs to be a reality. Yeah. As much as I'd like to end our panel and drop the mic on that note, I do, I, we have a minute more, so I do want to get to your question. Please ask, and then we'll, we'll try to answer it fast. Yeah, sure. So uh, the Tron specific protocol, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how do we edge off uh, China, I guess. How do we compete against them in a way that benefits everyone and can perhaps leverage their competitors in the Southeast Asia region. Um, there has been a huge pushback from the conservative side of politics against that deal, arguing that it sends jobs overseas and it uh, doesn't work in America's interest. Uh, in the opinion of the panel, this is more of a trade policy question. Uh, does the TPP help or aid America's strategic interests in terms of where we compete with China economically. John? <laughs> that, that's a great question, but at 12 minutes of five, um, <laughs> I think I'm going to say, uh, can we talk over a beer? Oh, because uh, I, I, agree. <laughs> I, hear, I hear there, I hear there will be refreshments or or something at least. So uh, maybe there will be an opportunity for that. You're good. I don't mean to blow you off. I'm just saying, it's it's a long, complicated question. Dan, yeah, same I, answer. I, I, same answer. I think you know, in in ways, yes, but you know, same answer. Yeah. All right, we unanimous. So with that, thanks to the panel. Really appreciate it.